and welcome to another episode of our Able Voice Podcast Debrief Series. We have a special guest joining us today, Mr. George, who is Kim's little pup. Yes. So we might hear some barks and some, some little pitter patters <laughs> throughout the episode, but he's just too cute to resist. Um, if you're not watching on the YouTube series, then go ahead and and check out the YouTube channel video of this debrief, um, just so that you can see how cute George is. (laughs) But today, we're going to be talking all about our episode with our woodwind and brass panel. And this episode was really dear to my heart Mm -hmm. as a fellow woodwind and brass player. Um... I'm not sure if I really sh- have ever shared my my story to musicianship on our podcast. Uh, I think maybe not in as much depth. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, I'll share it again. Yeah. <laughs> A little recap. <laughs> A little recap. Um, I started playing instruments. My first instrument actually picked it up when I was six years old uh, with the Salvation Army Band. And my mom was my teacher. (laughs) So there was a lot of um, love, but also a lot of tension, as you can imagine, with with that kind of a relationship. Um, (laughs) Can you imagine somebody's first instrument being a trumpet? I can imagine being yours. (laughs) (laughs) And the noises that came out of that thing, like, and and having to practice at home. Oh, my gosh. Um, And then my mom also having to hear it, it, like, formally during our lesson time. Um, And it's just, like, bless her heart because (laughs) I think the only thing worse than a trumpet being somebody's first instrument is a recorder. Oh gosh. Yes. Okay. And I have still to this day have no idea why they give us recorders in like um, elementary school in primary school. So that's like the first instrument that they give out to everybody. And it's just like awful. It's awful. (laughs) I was, I happen to be good at it though. So that was kind of funny. So I started with the trumpet and then in school I played the recorder and my music teacher was like, Hey, you know, you're really good at the recorder, Mm. whatever that means. (laughs) And, um, he was like, you should try to play the saxophone. I can teach you. And so, um, I, I got gifted a secondhand saxophone that I, I played, I started to play in, um, grade six and then I went to middle school I went I switched schools and I went to middle school and high school and got to really dig into that a little bit more Mm -hmm. and started to play in jazz bands and um, concert bands and win ensembles and it was really really a great experience and I really developed my love for for music during that time I think I always loved music because I was surrounded by it so much Um, In my youth, all of my family were musical and um, we sang in choirs and we did all of the things we would sing as a family together. And so it was always in me, but I didn't really know that I loved it and wanted to pursue music until I got to high school and really started to focus Mm. on that. And so that's a little bit about my journey and how I came to really love love music and and um the saxophone and woodwind and brass sounds um and so i went to university and my principal instrument was the saxophone so that was a unique experience i found out Mm -hmm. in relation to a lot of my cohort which is why this episode was really special to me because i'm i find that a lot of people who have that similar background or or principal instrument as a brass or woodwind instrument that's not per se like a flute or something that's relatively easy to bring into a session um it's sometimes difficult or creates barriers within the therapy space to to have that um as accessible accessible as we need it to be. Yeah, it's it's very it was very interesting conversation for me because I, I mentioned this in the episode, but I am not a woodwind or brass player as my primary instrument. I um, played the trombone in high school, which I loved and really should get back to a little bit more. Um, but as a vocalist, like my instrument is just always with me and for the most part accessible unless I'm having a 
a bad throw today. <laughs> um, we all have those. We do. Um, but it, it was interesting to, yeah, to talk about those barriers. And I mean, I think of Amelia specifically with her tuba. Um, I saw her bringing it into class and using it, and it was really awesome and has such wide applications. Um, but not the most accessible. When I was going into internships, I had my guitar, I had my voice, I had my um, percussion instruments, and um, even sometimes my keyboard, and even that was a lot, but I can't imagine lugging in um, a bigger instrument, or even talking about, I think we mentioned um, specific to the sax, like, you can't just pull that out and start yeah, playing. Yeah. Um, we all need to warm up all of our instruments, but some take um, a little a bit little more. A little bit more time, yeah. especially when you consider things like the weather, the mm. humidity, um, it's, it's just so you much more. Read. <laughs> exactly. You, you break a reed. All of these things, like um, the resin that you have to put on the cork before you put mm. your mouthpiece on, there, there are so many little intricate details that, that helped to make the sound quality decent enough that's not um, creating a barrier within your sessions because that, that's another conversation about, oh, why isn't this sounding great? Um, but you need to know, like, it takes so much time to prep yeah. to get that instrument, not even just to sight. It's like before every session, you would need to redo that process, which is a bit yeah. of a hassle, if, if I'm honest, yeah. um, and, and takes away some sometimes some of that valuable client interaction time. But I think that there are definitely ways around that. Mm -hmm. And we were having, this is what this conversation was just about, is opening that dialogue about how we could safely use our instruments within therapeutic settings. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things that are happening right now due to the pandemic is online sessions and that becoming something that, um, has really exploded during this time, but I also don't think it's going away. No. And so wanting to consider what are some of the safe ways that we can use mm -hmm. our, our instruments, our woodwind and brass instruments through this platform. And there are a lot of things to consider, like sound threshold and, right. um, you know, the the threshold of the the people that are on the other end receiving the therapy what does it sound like what are things that we can do to navigate that in terms of miking and 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 all of these things that we can consider so we came up with some really good ideas yeah if you haven't listened to the episode yet go listen to the episode because I am tempted to give them away no. again <laughs> <laughs> but you can go and and check out the really um, in depth dialogue that we had and and really real feelings yeah it wasn't all rainbows and daisies no which I loved <laughs> yeah I love that too I think it's important and I think this is this conversation specifically is very important both within our field of, of people of, of practicing therapists but also for the community in general um because like you said it's not all all rainbows and sunshine these are these are real things and I think for myself if I, on those days where I'm having a bad voice day and I don't have access to my main instrument well that's a barrier for myself in therapy, which sometimes, I mean, we do our best to not let it impact um, the, the therapeutic relationship, but sometimes it does. It's it's my main instrument. It's how I can best connect with someone. And that was a theme that came up quite a bit with um, everyone else talking about how to use your main instrument. Um, and it's just, it's that connection that we have. It's it's that musical voice. And, um, and it, it, it also opens up different doors for people to be able to engage um, mm -hmm. in the therapy and, and to find deeper connections because not everyone is going to connect to a voice or a guitar or a drum or a piano. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I just think that's really important for us to recognize within ourselves of there are so many people who have these other main instruments that are so interesting and so beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, and then also for the outward appearance of our field of like, let's make that more known. Yeah. And, you know, just bringing it full, full circle here, um, I've had clients, so I, I uh, most of my caseload is in long-term care, and I've had clients that really resonate with the brass sound yeah. and have had that as a big part of their life. And um, more specifically, especially in the area that we're in right now, there's a big um, Salvation Army community mm -hmm. and what the Salvation Army is known for outside of charity work is also their brass band and their their choirs and so the brass band I think has been something that is, has 
carried on throughout time and really that strong connection to that brass sound and even people that aren't involved in in the Salvation Army community know about like Christmas time mm -hmm. and seeing like the bells ringing and like having the the band go out and carol and uh having that connection to the music but also to your reality and bringing out those memories and those feelings that you have that are associated with those yeah. instruments and being able to engage in, in that kind of thing and like you said Kim opens up a new kind of connection that people can have within that therapy space by bringing in these different sounds and these mm -hmm. different feelings and these different interactions um super important and really special for yeah. us to get to experience as therapists but also for us to get to experience as a dyad of therapist and client. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh.